rebuke of the rich. James chapter 5, we're in the last chapter. We're going to go through the first six verses today, and then I'm going to cover the rest of the chapter next week in James. But before that, I don't know if it's a joke, but it, it's kind of the way we think. <laughs> the problem is this, it's not so funny because maybe it is the way we, we actually are. But here, is, here it is, morning joke. It says, one wise guy, notice I didn't say wise person, a wise guy, that's got a different connotation, said, they say it's better to be poor and happy than to be rich and miserable, right? You know, we, we've heard that. But, but when, when the bills are tight and we just wish there was a little bit more there, but couldn't something be worked out such as being moderately wealthy and just a little miserable? You know, that's kind of the way we actually want it to be, you know. But we, we, we know that that's right, but somewhere in the middle would maybe be a little bit nicer than, than that, yeah. All right, let's jump into this. Here, oh, that was from the Reader's Digest. Listen to this. Oh, volume. There we go. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. We were watching the uh, Olympics this week, and one of the channels that had it on almost full time was this this uh, CNBC, and this was one of the commercials that they kept playing. And of course, I'm preaching on money today, but what they're promoting is all the shows they have about money. And the one guy says on there, uh, the only thing that matters is money, you know, and uh, that's the way a lot of us think. James has some interesting things to say about, about being rich and when you are rich, what you should be doing about being rich. Let's look at our text today. Our text is James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. I'll read that for us as we, as we go through, starting with verse 1. Come now, uh, by the way, as I get into this, you know, there are some some, there are some really nice, encouraging verses in the Bible. Mickey had a great, encouraging message last week. I got to tell you something. This is not an encouraging message. <laughs> James lays into these people and balls them out, you know. So we're, we're going to look at that. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. you your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and it will and will eat your flesh like fire. Nice encouraging words here, huh? You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold the wages of the laborers who bow who mowed your fields which you kept back by fraud are crying out against you, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Okay, there's verses 1 through 6. Kind of a kind of a harsh tone that James picks up here as he as he lays into these couple of things that I that I've said here in our text James assumes the role of an Old Testament prophet because it's very similar to the way they sounded they'd come out and they'd thunder at the people you know and bawl them out um, thundering against the ungodly rich who oppress the poor the words of our text are scathing denunciation of the wrath to come now Throughout this book, he has often said, my brethren, my brethren. He doesn't say that in this text. 
While there may have been some professing Christians in the churches to which James wrote, uh, who were guilty of the sins he confronts here, his main target, it seems to me, his main target was the ungodly rich outside of the church. So here he takes off on what he sees in his society around him, the wealthy who were oppressing the poor, and lays into them. All right, so here's my outline. I don't know if you picked up one of our rebuke of the faith texts out there. Got three points. Only three points today. Okay? First one, a warning against hoarding wealth. A warning against hoarding wealth. Number two, I said number two, a warning against stealing wealth. And then number three, a warning against the decadence, decadence of wealth. Okay, so there's a nice outline for us to work from as we work our way through this message today. Okay, a warning, first of all, a warning against hoarding wealth. Do you ever watch that show, Hoarders, Hoarders, Hoarding? Um, we, we got to talk about that a little bit, and it, uh, this wasn't in reference to uh, this message, but... But we got to talking about, oh, I know what it was in reference to. Dan was telling us about what his attic looks like. That's what it was about. Yeah. <laughs> and we said, I said, isn't there a little bit of hoarder in all of us? We like to save things and accumulate things and keep things. And, and sometimes, we mentioned yesterday, sometimes there's an emotional attachment to it. Even, even to somebody else, it's a piece of junk, but it's a, got an emotional attachment to us. So we, we like hoarding things. Well, th these guys like hoarding their, their money. Their money. Um, Come now, you rich, weep and howl. In other words, repent for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. We got a picture here from James that these guys have hoarded wealth and money and gold and silver and they have just stockpiled it and it's sitting there, it's setting up there in their attic for years and years and it is rotting and it's moth eaten and their gold and silver are corroded and they're just, they're, they're, not, they're not doing anything with it, it's just sitting there. I said to somebody yesterday, um, we have, a, you know, an attic where the rafters are, and I've been up. We got one of these pull-down steps for the in the garage, but there's a fire block thing between the garage and the house, and there's a little hole in there. I have never, since I've owned that house for 20 years, I have never. I've been up in the garage attic, but I have never been in the attic of the main part of the house because there's that firewall there, and I could go through there and look. and And I often wondered. I wonder if the people who owned it before, they robbed a bank, and there's several million, <laughs> several million dollars stored up in that attic that they forgot about. And I probably ought to go up there and look and see if that money is up there or not. You know, well, that's kind of the picture of what. These guys, what James is talking about with these guys, they're hoarding their wealth and they're do, doing nothing with it. The Bible says there is nothing wrong with being wealthy. But your priorities need to be right. And what you do with the wealth that the Lord gives you, you will be accountable for. Now, let's look at a few cross-references I have. Well, a summary. i got a summary of what this says here. It is evident that the priority of their lives was to earn money and hoard the money and not use the money for the kingdom of God. Scripture indicates that the money is a tool for believers to use for the kingdom of God. Our priority needs to be not hoarding money. That they need very good English. You can tell I wrote that out. The pri our priority needs to be not hoarding money, but using the money that the Lord gives to us to expand his kingdom, to bring glory to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the purpose of the wealth that the Lord may allow us to have. 
Cross-reference, Matthew chapter 6. You remember chapter Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 all go together. Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, commonly known as the Sermon on the Mount. That's right, all of you who answered me on that. Yeah, that's commonly known as the Sermon on the Mount. We're in chapter 6 here, and um, um, Jesus refers to some of this. 19 through 21, he says this. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. That's exactly what James is bawling these people out about. Where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Don't lay it up here on earth and think you're... Remember last week that parable we looked at where the guy who had great, great crops and he built barns so that he could just sit back and take it easy. Jesus says, don't lay up for yourself treasures on the earth, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. It's interesting, Jesus talked about, James talked about their hoarded wealth was moth-eaten and rusting. I think James had reference back to the Sermon on the Mount here where Jesus says, this, the things that you store up in heaven uh, aren't going to be moth-eaten and aren't going to get rusty. I, saw, so I don't know, maybe it was one of you. Somebody put on Facebook just last night, and uh, Jesus was standing with Billy Graham, and he said to Billy Graham, he says, when I said to go into all the earth and make disciples, I didn't mean you had to do that all by yourself, Billy. <laughs> I thought that was cute, huh? Uh, yeah, we lost a great evangelist, uh, world-known, well-respected. We lost him. He went home to be with the Lord this week. He had treasures laid up in heaven. Uh, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, I think that's an interesting verse. If we were to say something like that, we would say it reverse. We would say, well, wherever your heart is, that's where your treasure is going to be. Okay? But Jesus turned that around because he knew that our heart can be influenced. He knew that our heart can be affected. And he says, well, wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart is going to begin to love and your heart is going to begin to focus on and that's going to be the priority of your life. And Jesus gave us two Two alternatives, either laying up on earth and then our heart's going to come to love that money here on this earth, or laying up treasures in heaven and our heart's going to be focused on the kingdom of God. Now, that's in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. Matthew 6, verse 24, a few verses later, in that same context, Jesus says this. He says, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and... And it's an interesting Greek word. It's been translated as money here. Uh, the old King James. Remember the old King James word there? Remember what it was? Mammon. Yeah. Well, it's an interesting Greek word. It literally means... Uh, the things that money can buy is the Greek word that's used there. And Jesus says you cannot serve both God and mammon, or the things that you can just sit back and enjoy because you got a lot of money. Now, this is important for us to realize. One thing, it says either God's going to be your master or money's going to be your master. And that's something we need to realize, is that, is that if money becomes a of, of, um, high, important priority in our life, we don't master it, it begins to master us, and we become its slave. You can't serve two masters. You neither, either need to set your priorities on God and His kingdom, or if you set them on money and wealth and enjoying this life, you're going to become a slave to that. Another cross-reference, verse 33. I know you thought it was the same thing, but did you see that number change up there, up at that top? So verse 33, just a few verses down, same context. Jesus is still in the Sermon on the Mount, talking about the same topic. Verse 33 says, but seek first. 
Remember who's your, who, where, where your heart is? And remember you can't serve two masters. And Jesus says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. The these things in the context is things that you need to get along, food and clothing and things that money can buy. Jesus says... I know, in your life you want to have these things. You're worried about where's our next meal going to come from? Where are we going to live? What if the house gets repossessed? What, how am I going to get to work? What's going on here? Jesus says, if you set me as your top priority, seeking first the kingdom of God, I will provide you with those things. You don't need to worry about them, but you need to set your priorities. You need to set the kingdom of God as the highest priority in your life. So all of them right here in the, same, in the same context in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, all dealing with our attitude and our heart's desire for money. Number two, a warning against stealing wealth. Verse 4, this is what James jumps on those rich people about here in verse 4. He says, Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields by the way, that word mowed doesn't mean like with a lawnmower, but it literally would go out with a, with a, what's that called? With the big blade on the end, a sickle. There we go. They'd go out with a big sickle and they would cut down the crops. That's what that word is referring to. The laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. These, uh, the, uh, I got a parable that Jesus told a parable next, and it really isn't teaching the same thing, but it just to give you the setting of how it often worked in Palestine in those days. Let's look at that. Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 and 2, and then I jump down to verse 8 here. This is the way it worked. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Many times... They were day laborers. We still might have some day laborers um, today. You know, I know John Nevikoski had talked about, um, he's, he's a union electrician, and they'll go down to the union hall and wait for a, a uh, employer to come, and he'll hire the electrician or hire the workers for that job. When that job is done, then they go back to the union hall and wait for another employer to come to hire them. This, similarly, um, the master went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius, that was a coinage of the, that day, of a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. I bring this parable up just to show you they would hire them for the day, send them out. At the end of the day, they would pay them the wage that they agreed upon. <clears throat> that they agreed upon. Okay? Jump down to verse 8. Uh, and when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. Well, you remember the parable. He hired people throughout the day, and he gave everyone, even those who only worked an hour, he gave everyone a denarii. But that wasn't pertinent to what I wanted you to see here. I wanted you to see how it was done. And this is what James is addressing. Notice in verse 2, it says, The laborers and the boss, they agree upon a certain amount. But then it comes down to the end of the day. Maybe they agreed upon uh, $50 a day. And it comes to the end of the day, and he goes to give them their money, and he says, okay, here's your $25. And the laborer says, no, wait, wait, what's going on here? We, I thought we agreed at the beginning of the day of $50. I'm sorry, here's your $25, get out of here. Or I'm going to have my, my big goon over there come and throw you out of here. You know, so... He cheated, they were cheating, the wealthy were cheating the laborers from what they had agreed upon. Why did he do that? Because his, his priority was on making more money. If I can pay my laborers less, I can, I can keep more of it. James says, I know, let me go back. James says that they, they had kept back by fraud it was crying out against them, and the laborers had prayed, Lord, 
my mortgage is due and it's $50 and I worked for $50, but my boss only gave me $25. Lord, he cheated me. Their prayer had gone up to the Lord and the Lord heard their prayer and the Lord knew what the guy was doing. James says that that has reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. Stealing. Um, Proverbs 20, verses 10 and verse 23. I think they're kind of interesting. Proverbs 20, verse 10 says, Unequal weights and unequal measures are both alike an abomination to the Lord. Now you read that and you say, what? What's that? What is that saying? Well, back in those days, many times when somebody came to buy some grain or buy something, it was measured by weight. And they didn't have the modern type of scales that we had. They had a balance. And a guy would have a pound weight. And he would take it and he'd put it on one side. And then they'd start pouring the grain in the other side. And when that balance balanced out, you know, it's going like this and it levels out, that would be a pound of grain. Well, what some people would do is they would shave off a little bit on that pound. It's clearly printed on there. It says one pound, you know. But then they would shave off some off of that. So they're only giving... Oh, let me get my math right. They're only giving 15 ounces, maybe 14 ounces, but it still looks like it's a pound weight. So they put that 14 ounce weight on the one side of the balance and start pouring grain in the other side and it balances out. And he says, okay, here you are, a pound of grain when it really wasn't. That was a common way of cheating people back in Solomon's day. So Solomon talks about unequal weights. is an abomination to the Lord. Think about that word, abomination. I think that's an interesting, an interesting word. It is something, are, are there things, if I were to say to you, are there things that are an abomination to you? You might say, oh yeah, well how do you feel about those things? Oh, they are horrible and they just make me so mad. You know, that's what the word abomination means. Well, these are an abomination to the Lord. Every time the Lord would look down and see that guy with his cheating scale, it was wrong. And the Lord was angry about sin. Here's another one, verse 23. He says, unequal weights are an abomination to the Lord, and false scales are not good. Another way to cheat was to take your scale, and instead of having it balanced right in the middle, you just slide it over just a little bit. But you've got to push it over the right way, otherwise you're going to cheat yourself. You know, I think you've got to go this way with it. So, so a, a false scale, that was another way that they, again, abomination to the Lord, cheating, stealing, from people is an abomination to the Lord. Seven little things. This comes from the USA Today. Seven little things that almost everybody steals. I thought it was interesting. Now, my list would have probably been a little bit different, but this is kind of an interesting list. This is taken from the USA Today. Seven little things that almost everybody steals. Okay? Literally steals. We think it's small enough that nobody cares. <laughs> After preparing this message, I went to... Uh, on, on Ferris, we have, I, I teach in the College of Business, and then we have the LRC, which is another building, and they built this big walkthrough between them and made it into a student lounge, and they literally have a Starbucks inside that student lounge area. And so I, I have to use it. I often go up to the Starbucks there. And while I'm waiting to get my coffee, I often walk over, and they got the Splenda uh, over there, you know, and I'll take about four or five of them and stick them in my pocket. You know, I, I paid for it when I... And I was studying this message, and I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute. Isn't, I know it's small. They, the students that are working there, they probably don't care, but that's stealing. And I put those Splenda packets back. <sighs> Is that stealing from them? Here's seven things that people often steal and think it's okay because they're just small little things that people steal all the time, and it's okay. Pens. <laughs> I am really mad at you. I had a whole bunch of anchor pens out there on that table, and they're all gone. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Businesses might want you to. Yeah, yeah. 
But sometimes when they don't want you to, we just uh, we get done signing that and we stick it in our pocket, you know? Pens. Uh, this is their list, not mine, but they said that. A spot in line. That is literally that stealing time, that stealing time from other people who are waiting in line, and we're stealing a spot in line. That is stealing. Hotel amenities. Oh, oh, hotel amenities. I don't know. Is it wrong to take that unused coffee packet that they have in your room with the coffee maker? We always take those home with us. Oh, that's complimentary. Okay, okay. They they throw. Okay, so that was that. that I'm, I'm cleared on that one. I, <laughs> but those towels <laughs> and the bed sheets and the extra pillows, those were those weren't right, huh? Yeah. Here's another one. Uh, parking spots. Yeah, I saw on, on Facebook there was a car. It was back. It, it had gone by the parking spot and was backing into it. And while it it stopped and started backing up, another car comes zoom and pulled right in there. Yeah, stealing parking spots or parking in in the handicap places. Yeah, I, I I know some people. I was gonna say my friend. I won't tell you who it is, but I know some people who they had had uh, uh, an injury and so they'd gotten one of these um, handicap parking stickers and they kept it so that they can continue on even though they're totally healthy now. They every time they want to park close, they just put that handicap sticker on their mirror and park in the handicap spot. Parking spots, huh? Books and magazines we often wind up taking or keeping. Uh, lighters. I don't know that I take lighters, but that was on their that was on their on their list. And number seven was restaurant straws, napkins, and extra condiments like uh, like Starbucks Splenda packets. I probably could fit in in number seven there. Yeah, this was their list. Maybe it's not all applicable to you, but I want you to think about the little things that maybe we compromise on and um, uh, we shouldn't. We shouldn't. Now, I don't know. I don't know. You judge for yourself. I have in my pocket, I have a flash drive. It is a 64 gig, which is a good size flash drive. It was left in one of my computer labs at Ferris, it was left from one semester to the next semester and the student never came back to get it. I looked on it and there was no indication of whose it was. So I took it home. Is that okay? I shouldn't ask you guys, Lord, is that okay? Yeah. My point in all of this is, you know, we need to be care we need to be, we need to be ethical people. We need to have integrity in our lives. And sometimes it's little compromises of little stealing, little things that compromise our integrity. James balls these, these bosses out for cheating the workers out of their wages, stealing money from them. Okay, point number three, a warning against the decadence of wealth, the decadence of wealth. Verses 5 and 6, <clears throat> excuse me. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. That's the key word there. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. Of course, that has reference. You take a, you, you got a lamb that you're going to butcher. You feed them and you fatten them up uh, shortly before you, you, you butcher them. You know, and James has reference to that. These rich people... Uh, they were living in self-indulgence and they were, they were just fattening themselves up for the judgment of the Lord coming on them. Verse 6, you have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. So the decadence, the decadence of wealth. I want you to think about that word self-indulgence. I was thinking about this and a word that crossed my mind was one of the fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians chapter 5, we have a list of the fruit of the Spirit. One of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. So I began to think about self-indulgence versus self-control. Huh? Think about those two things. With self-indulgence, the body rules and controls the person's life. He follows every whim of what the body wants. Yeah, I'm telling the men's Bible study. Um, I, Pastor Herrick isn't the slimmest of people here. Uh, I was Mickey's size at one time. Oh, no, I probably wasn't down that far. But 
In the evening, as I'm sitting home and watching TV, and I pop up out of the couch and I walk into the kitchen for no reason. I'm not hungry. We had supper just a little while ago, but I pop out and I walk into the kitchen and I open the cupboard doors or I open the refrigerator door and I say, oh, yeah, okay, and I grab something. Doesn't matter what it is. And I go back and I sit on the couch and I, I munch it down. And then maybe 15, 20 minutes, yeah, 15, 20 minutes is all uh, later. I'm sitting there and all of a sudden I pop up from the couch and I walk out into the kitchen and I open the cupboard doors looking for something else again. You know, huh? Uh, Self-indulgence. I'm simply doing, I enjoyed eating, so I'm going to go do it again. Huh? He follows every whim of what his body wants. And that could be in the area of sexual sins. It could be in the area of of wherever. Self-indulgence. With self-control, the mind which knows right from wrong is in control. It says no to every desire of the body. It does what is right and what is honoring to God. The fruit of the spirit of self-control, we say no to self-indulgence. That's what we need to do, is we need to learn self-control. They were being self-indulgent. They had the money, why not go spend it on myself and enjoy these things? We need to learn self-control. I often, in my prayer life, I pray that the Lord would build into my life the fruit of the Spirit, that I might have love, that I might have joy, and I often think about, Lord, I need self-control in my life to control those whims and desires that I may have. Build into my life self-control. I think I got a cross-reference here. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 10. So a number of verses here. Let's look at this. Yes, 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. Paul and James picks up on money here. You know, people, people sometimes don't like it when the pastor, oh, that pastor, all he preaches on is money because he wants us to give more to the church. Well, I'm just following through James, and James picked up on this topic here, okay? 1 Timothy. Paul picks up on the topic as well. He says this, but godliness, living a godly life, with contentment is great gain. That is a strong verse there. I wonder how contented you are. Those rich people that James is talking about, they hadn't learned contentment. It's rather interesting. When Paul talks about contentment earlier in the book of, I think it's Ephesians, He says, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Now that's interesting because he says, I have learned that. That's interesting because that implies that there was a point when Paul wasn't content and through the offerings or the financial gifts, sometimes they would come in and he'd have plenty. Sometimes they wouldn't come in for months. He learned contentment through that. He learned it. It was built into his life. There's another quality we could be praying for. Not only self-control, but we could be praying, Lord, build contentment in my life so that I'm not always upset about not having this and not having that. We need to have contentment. Verse (laughs) 7, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take away And we cannot take anything out of the world. huh? When the baby was born and came out of the mother's womb, it didn't have luggage with it. It didn't reach back and pull out a suitcase full of of things that had collected up till that time, you know? They brought nothing into this world, and when we die, we don't take anything out of this world. All the material possessions we have stay here. So why not be content? Why spend your whole existence collecting and hoarding and and trying to build up your wealth and then you die and it stays here? He goes on. But if we have food and clothing and uh, with these we will be content. There he is. But those who desire to be rich, those were the ones James was talking about, fall into temptation desiring when you have an inordinate desire to be rich it becomes a temptation temptation is easy to catch you 
into a snare. You know what a snare is. When we were kids, I don't think we ever caught anything with it, but we had seen that you can, uh, you can take a, what we did is we took a box and we propped it up with a stick and we put some lettuce underneath it and we were hoping that a rabbit would come in there and would knock the stick out and the box would fall on the rabbit and, and um, we'd, we'd catch a rabbit. I don't think we ever did catch a rabbit, but it was a snare. It was set up something that is, is, is hidden but all of a sudden going to spring and snap on you. You've seen it where they bend, bend the tree over and they tie it down and then they put the loop on the ground and uh, the person they want to catch steps into that loop and then they cut the rope and the tree pulls them up. That's a snare. That's exactly what the inordinate desire to be rich does to us. It snares us into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Wow. Wow, that's a pretty strong verse, huh? We, uh, we, these, these temptations to be rich, they make us senseless, and we have harmful desires that lead us to destruction. Now, somebody has said um, this verse, verse 10, is the most misquoted verse in the entire Bible. You've probably heard that. And, and it, it is. It is often misquoted. It is often misquoted that people say money is the root of all evil. Now, Paul doesn't say that here to Timothy. He says the love of money, verse 9, having that desire to be rich, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. The love of money got a hold of them and they wandered away from the faith. Well, what, what a warning we have here. Uh, James, Paul, uh, other places, uh, cheating people is an abomination to the Lord. We need to have finances, and money in the proper priority in our lives. All right, here's my conclusion. As believers, we need to be careful about the priority of money in our lives. Our top priority, our top priority needs to be the kingdom of God and using our, somebody spelled that wrong. I don't know who did that. Must have been my secretary typing this up for me. Using our money for the kingdom of God. That's the purpose of it. That's why we have it in our lives. Home, food, shelter, and then using it for the kingdom of God. We need to be careful not to cheat or steal from others. We need to be honest in all of our affairs. We need to have integrity. I like that term. We need to have integrity in our lives. And then I said, we need to realize that a high priority on wealth can be a trap and a snare and can harm our spiritual lives. Here's your assignment. I, I teach at college and I'm often saying that. Here's your assignment, you know. Here's your assignment for the week. Begin to pray, Lord, reveal in my life a wrong attitude for money and help me to correct that. That would be a good prayer for you as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, reveal in my life a wrong priority, a wrong attitude towards money, and help me to correct that. Let's bow in prayer. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this passage in James. We thank you for the warning uh, both James and Paul and Solomon give to us about money. Father, help us to use it for your kingdom. Help us to have it as the, as the right priority. Might we seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness and simply allow the blessings that you give us, the financial blessings you give us, to be used for the kingdom of God. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mike, you have a